going to open in prayer if I could, please. Lord, you just couldn't love us any more or any less than you do right now. No matter who we are or what we've done, you love us. And Lord, I just ask right now that you would just quiet our hearts, that you would just walk among us, and just help us to know that you are right here in this room. We thank you that we can be here too. We love you, and we give you these next few minutes, Lord, that you would just touch people's hearts in a way that only you can do. Help us to be still so that we can hear your voice. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If someone had asked me what is a Christian, I would have said, well, if you're born in America and you're kind to people, I guess. That would make you a Christian if you go to church. And then if they would say, well, what about heaven? How do you get into heaven? I would say, well, don't kill anybody. <laughs> You'll probably get to heaven. Romans 12, 2 says, do not change yourselves to be like the people of this world, but be changed within by a new way of thinking. Then you will be able to decide what God wants for you. You will know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. I am privileged and excited to be here to share with you how a great, big, wonderful God came out of nowhere and changed my life. I was lost, I was lonely, and I was looking for answers to life. I wanted to know who I was and where I was going and what am I doing here. I just didn't know. I was looking for peace and happiness and answers to life. He touched my life because he loved it was precious to him and important. He breathed his life into me a long time ago because he wanted it to last and be used. You know, Christianity is not a religion. It's a personal relationship with the living God. It is the most exciting and revolutionary discovery in all of life. I was 26 years old when I made this discovery. And I'd like to take you back today, just a little bit, and share some of the events leading up to this discovery. I was born number six into a family of nine children. We lived way out in the country in a little tiny house with an outhouse out back. We didn't have very much money, but we didn't know it. My mother was very loving and patient and beautiful and kind and tired. To share with us and cry with us and laugh with us. Every time she put lipstick on or combed her hair, poor mom, there were kids jumping all around her saying, where are you going, mom, where are you going? Can I go with you? Can I go? She never got a break. Never. My dad was a hard worker. He was funny. He was talented. And he could sing and play any stringed instrument by ear. 
He loved his kids more than anything in the whole wide world. Like I said, we didn't have much financially or materially, but we didn't know it because we had so much love and music and laughter inside of our home. Outside our home and way up in the sky was God. He nev we never went to church. <clears throat> we didn't have a TV for a very long time, so on the weekends we played music. Our friends and neighbors would drive in the driveway and sometimes bring their own instruments and we would sing and play music until it was bedtime. And we always had a big bowl of popcorn. <laughs> it's great to be from a great big family like this, if you're one of the kids. <laughs> At 16, I prayed to a God that I wasn't sure was there. I didn't know if he was listening. I didn't know if he would answer. But I prayed one thing. I wanted a big family of my own. All I can say is, be careful what you pray for. <laughs> we took baths on Saturday night, whether we needed it or not. <laughs> on the back porch in an old galvanized wash tub. Mom had six daughters, and it took her most of Saturday night to tie our hair up in little rag strips so that at least part of the next week we'd have some curls. When we had company, we slept two in a bed before four, two at the head and two at the foot. You always woke up with somebody's foot in your face. <laughs> When I was 10 years old, my dad built two more bedrooms and an indoor bathroom. Whoa. 11 people and one little bathroom. Dad said that's how we learned how to dance. <laughs> Waiting our turn to get in. <laughs> As a teenager, I was shy and I was lonely and I had a very serious inferiority complex. I used to wonder if there was a God and if there was, I resented him for making me the way he did. I knew that if I was ever going to find happiness, I would have to overcome these problems on my own. I entered the secretarial field right out of high school, 1960. <laughs> and I had two really deep, deep, deep goals in mind. Are you ready? Here it comes. I wanted to be pretty, and I wanted to be somebody. At age 21, I began a career in country music. I joined a group called Jack Roberts and the Evergreen Drifters. We had a television show on KOMO TV Channel 4 for nine years, and I was their little girl singer with the short skirt and the fringe, and I just loved it. I was on my way to fame and fortune. I was going to be a star, and everyone was going to know me. I had many opportunities to work with people who were in the business. Jack would, was the country music promoter for the Northwest, so he would bring these big names out <coughs> several times a year and do big shows, and so our little group would open for the shows, and so I got to meet a lot of those people. And you know what? I saw very little happiness. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get it, because they were doing what I thought I wanted to do. Why aren't they happy? So I started to ask myself, what do I really want? You know, do I want a husband and a family? Or do I want a career where I would be in a different city every night with strangers all around and no one to go home to? It took me nine years to decide. 
outside, <laughs> but I walked away from the bright lights and the guitar, and then I really started searching for the answers to life. I went to Mill City, Oregon, where my oldest sister Nancy lived with her four children. That was my favorite place to be. And while I was there, Nancy told me about God. She said that he loved me, and he had a plan for my life. <clears throat> she said because God chose, that man chose his own way, he was separated from God. Fellowship was broken, and the world became a very sinful place. But God never stopped loving us. So in order to bridge that chasm between a holy God and a sinful man, God sent his son Jesus Christ to live on the earth as a man like us. He walked among a very broken and sinful people that he loved so very much. He performed many miracles and he promised that whoever believes in him will be forgiven of every sin they ever committed and that they will never die, but instead live with God for eternity in heaven. This man, Jesus, God's very own son, placed himself on a splinter dirty <coughs> old cross and let them drive nails into his hands and his feet they placed a crown of thorns on his head that dug deep into his skin. He hung on that cross with blood and tears falling down his face. <laughs> and you know what he said? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But wait, Nancy said, that's not the end. In three days, he came to life again. He woke up. He's alive today. And we can know him in a personal way. I just stared at her. I said, Nancy, this sounds like a fairy tale to me. I said, do you really believe this? And she said, absolutely. This is the gospel. It is the truth. She quoted John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And also John 10.10, 10, Christ said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I was 26 years old. I had never heard anything like that in my whole life. I began to watch and listen and ask questions. I even went to church. And I met people who loved me and they didn't even know me. I saw a quality in their lives that I knew I didn't have. Nancy had given me a book called The Cross and the Switchblade by Pastor David Wilkerson. It was, it was, just a little pocket book, but it talked about himself as a young pastor walking the streets of the most gang-infested areas of New York City late at night, talking to the worst gang members imaginable about Jesus. I was just mesmerized. I, 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 I couldn't even imagine one of the worst gang members gang leaders was a Puerto Rican man named Nicky Cruz. He had a miraculous conversion to Christ through this young pastor. And Nancy walked in one day and she said, look what I found. And she handed me another book and it was a 
<clears throat> another one story of Mickey Cruz. It was his story. And I was just, I couldn't get a hold of it fast enough because I was just mesmerized by the story of what God was doing in this man. And, and now this, it was called Run Baby Run. And you tell me if this is a coincidence, but when I was halfway through the book, I looked in the newspaper in Salem, Oregon, and guess who was coming to town? <laughs> Mickey Cruz. He was coming to speak at the Four Square Church in downtown Salem. Nancy's friend Mary Lou Smith said she would go with me. I wanted to hear him. I wanted to hear his story. So it was in the middle of July, one of the hottest days in the summer. People were packed into this four square church. They were standing along the walls, sitting along the aisles. It was just incredible. We were just packed in there. And he came out on the platform and he was about as tall as a Smurf from where we were standing. <laughs> and he spoke with a very broken English. And so I was trying so hard to hear what he was saying, to understand what he was saying. And all of a sudden, he, I did hear him mention altar call. Mm. And I said, altar call? I never heard that before. <coughs> and all of a sudden, people started standing up and going forward. Some of them were crying, and some of them, and I'm just watching people. And my eyes are huge, and I'm going, what are we going to do? And so, I felt something stir within me. And I looked at Mary Lou and I said, I'm not going down there. And she said, well, you don't have to go down there. And I said, well, I'm not. <laughs> she said, okay. <laughs> so I sat there a few more minutes and I looked at her again and I said, I am not going down there. And she said, then don't. <laughs> and all of a sudden there was this sensation of someone barely touching my elbows, fingertips, and it raised me to my feet, and I stood up, and I looked at her, and she said, I'll wait for you. <laughs> so now I'm crawling over people. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going to happen to me. People are saying, oh, praise the Lord, sister. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'm going, what? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> they usher us all into this back room and there's no furniture just four walls so people are standing along the walls in little clumps some are crying some are praying and I'm standing there with my back against the wall and eyes like turkey platters <laughs> and the door bursts open and here comes Mickey Cruz with an aide and he walks right over to me plants his hand on my head and starts praying for the evil spirits to come out of me. Well, guess what I did? <laughs> I pushed him in the chest <laughs> as hard as I could, and I said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> and I was freaked out. I ran for the door, I ran down the hall, and out into the street looking for the car. And here comes Mary Lou with her little purse and her high heels, just typically coming down towards me with a big smile, thinking she's going to hear something wonderful. And I said, get me home. I said, if this is Christianity, I don't want any part of it. Well, she stayed with me for the next four hours and explained to me that what Nikki Cruz did was not wrong. It was just a thing. Mm -hmm. That everybody does things in a different way. And she talked to me again about the things that Nancy shared with me. Bless her sweet heart. She said I would have peace and joy and a love for people that came straight from God. All I had to do was invite Jesus into my heart. And she said, peace? I love peace. I love peace. And I wanted peace. 
That's what I've been searching for here for a very long time. <laughs> After she went home, I got on my knees by my bed in the dark. And I prayed, Jesus, if you are real, I want you to come into my life. And nothing happened. So I said it again a little bit louder. And then I said, you know what, Jesus? If you can hear me, I said, I'm going to trust you. I have this much faith. I'm going to give it to you, all of it. And I'm going to trust that you will show me that you are in my life. And I went to sleep. And I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it felt like somebody's arms were around me. And I had so much peace in my life. And I knew, I knew he was there. And I didn't want to go to sleep because I was afraid it would go away. So at four o'clock, I opened my eyes again. And I kind of heard a voice in my spirit that said, see, I'm still here and I will never leave you. My attitudes, appetites, desires, they all began to change. My life began to form a pattern as God revealed himself to me. I had a special love for people that I didn't even know. And I finally had a purpose and an inner peace. Man, I love peace. <clears throat> Pascal is a great physicist and philosopher. He says there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that cannot be satisfied by only by anything but Jesus Christ himself. People try to cram all that stuff into that little vacuum, don't they? Drugs and sex and alcohol and whatever. Nothing fits in there but Jesus. That's the only thing that will make us feel whole. So the first thing I did as a Christian was appoint myself as God's first right-hand assistant. <laughs> so I'm going to help him bring everybody in my family to Christ. Well, you can imagine how well that went over. <laughs> and I also pretty much told God what I wanted him to do to make me happy. I want this and how about this? And I've been wanting, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, that didn't go well either. <laughs> but I couldn't give him free reign because he might make me dye my hair black, put it in a bun, take all my makeup and send me to Africa as a missionary. <laughs> and I certainly didn't want to do that. But you know what? I learned that God has his own plan for each one of us that will make us happier than anything we could ever think of on our own. He wants us just as we are, but to let go and let him work through us. He will not ask us to do anything without giving us the desire and the power to do it. He wants us to be Lord of all, or not Lord at all. We all know that the Christian life is not a bed of roses. It's sometimes really hard. In fact, it's harder to live for Jesus than it is to just exist for yourself. Mm -hmm. But we as Christians go through exact, the exact same things that other people do. Pain, heartache, loss, tragic accidents. But Jesus said, I am with you always and I will never leave you. We will never go through anything alone and we will never have to go through what he went through for us romans 8 38 and 39 is my favorite nothing can separate us from his love death can't and life can't the angels won't and all of the power of hell itself cannot keep god's love away our fears for today, our worries for tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky, or in the 
deepest ocean. Nothing can separate us from the love of God made known through Jesus Christ. I had been a Christian about a year when I was called into the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. This is an international, non-denominational Christian organization that is designed to present the claims of Christ to the entire world. Well, I ended up working at their headquarters in the office of their president, Bill Bright, Dr. Bill Bright. I didn't know the Bible well. I'd only been a Christian for just a year. And I was so worried I would look like a fool around all these mature Christians <laughs> every day. I was sitting in the dining hall one night after dinner, just watching people. They were laughing together, and they were all so happy to be there together. And there I sat. There was a man a few seats away, and he was watching me. And I looked at him, and he said, are you happy to be here? And I said, no, sir. <laughs> and he said, how come? And I said, because I've only been a Christian a short time. I don't know the Bible. I don't know what I'm doing here. I said, God made his very first mistake. <laughs> he pulled out a business card, and he turned it over. And he drew a picture of a vine and several branches coming out of the vine. Some were long, some were short. He said, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. Which branch are you? I said, this one. <laughs> he said, does that make you any less spiritual than this one? He said, once we are connected to the vine, we are as spiritual as we're ever going to be. We're just not as mature as we're going to be. And I was confusing spirituality with maturity. He reminded me that God doesn't expect me to do anything but let him do his work through me. He wants our availability, not our ability. As time went on, they wanted the staff to go door to door and witness to people. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm not going to do that, I told them. I am not doing that. And they said, well, everybody's doing that, so let's just do it and see what happens. Man, I tell you, I was wearing seven pairs of Depends that day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, we, and we went I, with a friend, I went with a friend down to the beach. And there were houses just flying along, just waiting for us to come up and ring the door. Yeah. I was just shaken. So we go up on the porch. It was her job to ring the doorbell. It was my job to pray they weren't home. <laughs> <laughs> and there were many people who were very kind. They thanked us but I'm already a Christian. I already know Jesus. I have my own church. I'm not interested, thank you, or just a big slam in our face. And then I looked across and I saw these two little old ladies talking over the fence. And I said, man, I love senior citizens. Let's go talk to them. So we went over there and they were standing in the sun just enjoying each other's company. And I walked, we walked up and I said, could we talk to you for a minute? Mm -hmm. And this one lady who looked like a retired professional wrestler <laughs> said, is this about religion? <laughs> and I said, um, well, um, well, um, kind of, I guess. And she said, come on, Ethel, we don't have to listen to this. And they went in the door and slammed the door. And then it hit me. <laughs> And I told my friend, you know what? We are the ones that are choosing who to talk to. We need to ask God to show us who is ready to talk to him, who's wondering about him, whose heart is open. We need to ask him to show us. 
I said, let's go down to the beach. And if he shows us somebody, fine. But if he doesn't, we don't have to do it. <laughs> and so we went down on the beach. And we're walking along the beach. And I look out by the water, and there's a little old man sitting on a log all by himself. And as soon as I saw him, I said to the Lord, I'm not going out there. Before I knew it, we were standing right beside him. And I said, what are you doing out here all by yourself? And he said, oh, I'm just, I'm just thinking. And I said, what are you thinking about? And he said, oh, life, I guess. I said, do you ever think about God? And he thinks, well, honey, to tell you the truth, that's what I was wondering about. Mm -hmm. And I said, can I sit down and tell you a story of what happened to me? And he said, you sit right down here. And we both sat on each side of him. And I told him my whole story, my testimony. Little tears just made their way down and through the wrinkles in his cheek. He sat there and listened to every word of it. And I said, have you ever invited Jesus to come into your heart? He said, no, honey, I don't believe I have. Would you like to? And he said, you know, I believe I would. And then I started bawling my brain out. And I said, oh my gosh. And he goes, everything's going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard crying. I'm happy. So I, we bowed our heads. And he prayed that little man who has lived most of his life already on this earth prayed and asked the living God to come into his little old heart. And when he was finished, I said, man, we're going to see you in heaven. And he said, yes, you will. And so we just waved at him and, and we went on our way. I knew my heart was at home. And that's where I really wanted to minister. So after a couple of years, I went back home to Olympia. I went back to work for the legislature and I was serving in my local church. And one day my pastor said, I'd like to introduce you to one of the guys in our congregation. And I said, yeah, you and everybody else that I know wants to introduce me to somebody and they're always nerds, nerdy. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to. And he said, just, he's a new Christian, and it's not going to hurt you one bit. And I said, all right. So here was this tall, handsome, big old farmer. He'd been a Christian a short time, about a year. And he'd been divorced a year. And I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Remember my prayer for a big family? <laughs> I thought it was too late because I was already 32 years old. I'd never found anybody I wanted to marry. Well, he had four children and they came to live with us. Wes was 17, Shelly was 16, Wendy was 15, and Angie was 10. There's Angie, right there. <laughs> she used to fit right here in my armpit. She'd just be always there hugging me all the time. <laughs> she also wore little glasses, which were my favorite thing on kids. I always said, if I have kids, one of them's going to wear glasses, whether they need them or not. <laughs> I wanted to be 
be a stay-at-home mom. That's what I wanted. And I was very thankful that I was able to do that. Merv and I were in love. I became a farmer's wife. And I loved her. Another thing I always wanted was a blonde-haired, brown-eyed baby boy. <laughs> and two years later, Matthew Jason Ward was born on January 22, 1977. He was nine pounds, two ounces. He was 22 inches long. After 22 hours of hard labor, <laughs> man, that hurt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Being a parent is not easy, is it? No one knows how to be a parent until they are one. We all do the very best we can. But if we can teach our children to love God and walk with him, we've given them the greatest gift there is. When Matt was two years old, my sister Linda and her husband went down in a small plane and they left three children. Rob was 16, John was 14, and Kelly was 11. They came to live with us. Now I'd been married four years and I had eight kids. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> we all loved each other very much, but there were struggles and we were all grieving over such a huge loss trying so hard to be somewhat normal. The kids had lost everything, not only their parents, but their friends and their church and their home and everything they ever knew. And they were taken out of the only town they'd ever lived in, brought to Olympia to start all over. God didn't say life would be easy but he promised to be with us. Through our excruciating pain, he was there to provide comfort and peace and strength to go on. Everyone knows there's a difference you feel in the love of your own children and the love you feel for others, other people's children. And I couldn't bear for these three kids to go through their life without that kind of love. So I began to pray that God would give me a mother's love for them. And I know I'm not their mother, but I love them as much as if I were. Mm -hmm. Love truly is a gift. The kids were growing up and moving out, school, work, marriage. And then there were grandbabies and they seemed to be popping out all over the place. <laughs> and I was so happy. After seven years of marriage and washing zillions and zillions of tube socks, <laughs> my husband walked in one day and said he didn't want to be buried anymore. <laughs> he was gone in two days. I was shocked and I was devastated and I didn't even see it coming. He not only walked away from me, but he also walked away from his Lord. You know, we all have different opportunities to see if Christianity really works at home with the door shut. Mm -hmm. And I am a living example that it works. Mm -hmm. You hurt, and you hurt like crazy. But I think God becomes more real to us during the hard times. I went through all the stages of loss, fear, depression, anxiety, rejection, anger, and bitterness. I felt at times that I didn't even want to go on, but I kept seeing Matt's little five-year-old face, and I knew I could never leave him. My mother took me to Hawaii she was so worried about me. And I was hurting so much. I, I was fearful of the future. I was having panic attacks every day. 
I found a secluded place on the beach, and I went by myself, and I began to cry out to God. And I told him, Lord, you have done so much in my life. And I said, I have loved you, and I've been faithful to you. And you have answered so many prayers. But right now, I am hurting so much that I don't even want to live. I was yelling at him. <laughs> I told him, if you are going to continue to be my God, you have to do something right now because I cannot stand this pain one more day. And you know what happened? I heard a voice in my spirit, a very strong voice inside my spirit. And this is what it said. The problem is not you. The problem is Mervyn and me, my husband and his Lord. He said, I have a great big job to do. And if I could do it without hurting you, without hurting grandpa, without hurting the kids, I would do it. But I can't. It's going to hurt, and it's going to hurt a lot, but only for a little while. And while you're hurting, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to love you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to guide you, I'm going to strengthen you, I'm going to make you stronger and better than you've ever been in your entire life. You have to get out of my way and let me do what I have to do. felt like a hundred pounds had lifted off of my shoulders. Life is sometimes like the seasons of the year. In the winter it's cold and dark and barren. <clears throat> you feel lonely and empty inside. You wonder if you'll ever be excited about anything or laugh again or, <clears throat> or sing again. We can't hurry the healing process, can we? But one day we will look outside and we will see a tiny flower peeking out of the ground. And then the next day there will be another and then another. And before we know it, spring is in full bloom. <coughs> Springtime always follows the winter. And the rainbow always follows the rain. I knew Merv had a girlfriend, and I, I had never met her. I was attending one of Matt's, my son's soccer games one day, and with my sister Diane, and I looked across the field, and I saw him standing there, and there was a lady beside him. And my first reaction was panic. I said to Diane, I got to get out of here. I said, I'm leaving right now. And all of a sudden, I heard again, I heard, what are you afraid of? It just stopped me cold. And I heard, you have got me. And I looked at Diane and I said, I'm going over to meet Sean. <laughs> and I walked right across the field, me and Jesus, we walked together. <laughs> And I went, I came, said, I came over to meet Shaw. And I met her. I liked her. She liked me. I thanked her for being so good to Matt. You know what? I was free. I was so free. Forgiveness is a powerful thing. husband Dick says it's that unforgiveness is like you drinking your poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> I believe that. It's kind of like that. But when you're free, it's, it's just a powerful thing. 
I was alone for the next 17 years. I was working at the legislature, serving in my church, raising Matt, and being a granny, and I finally loved my life again. But there were times when I was lonely, and I told God, I don't trust me to choose a life partner, so if you want me to have a life partner, you better bring him to me, because I don't, I don't know how to do that. My sister Diane was one of my very best friends. We were like Lucy and Ethel, and often <laughs> got into predicaments and getting the giggles at the wrong time and the wrong place, and even wetting our pants in public once in a while. <laughs> she was married to Dick, and Dick was a very strong man of faith, a good husband and a good father. I used to tell her, Diane, I hope you know how blessed you are to have a man like him. And she knew that very well and was so thankful. Diane and Dick went on a cruise to the Caribbean with some church friends one year. And on their way home, Diane became very ill. Soon after that, she was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And 58 days later, she was gone. Diane was 53 years old. And she had four children. This was another devastating loss for our family. Another heartache. Why does God pe take people like Diane and Linda? All they did was love people, share the gospel with them, laugh at them, make them feel so comfortable. I don't understand. But I guess you won't know the answer until we get there, right? I have a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> About a year and a half later, Dick was talking to God and he told him he didn't want to be alone. So, he made a list of what he wanted in a wife. He finished the list and he went, oh my word. <laughs> he read the list and described me. <laughs> When he told me, I grossed out and headed for the hills. <laughs> he was my brother, like my brother, for 29 years. He was my brother-in-law. We were best friends. We did everything together. I thought, oh my gosh, this is not right. This is not good. He, he goes, you know what? I know it's right, and I know we're supposed to be together. So I'm going to just wait as long as it takes, and I'm going to just be here. I want you to meet Debbie again. She's Dick's <laughs> older daughter, and she's over there. She's a grandma with three little grandchildren. Can you imagine that? Look at her. She's so cute. <laughs> she's just a <laughs> So anyway, I tell you, I just could not even imagine this. And so I love Dick but I was not in love with him. And there was nothing that I could do to change that. He refers to that time of when he was going with me, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I did end up marrying Dick. I need a Kleenex, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I did end up marrying him. I wish I could tell you that story because it is the most, the biggest miracle probably that ever happened in my life and Dick's. But I ended up with four more kids, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I just collect them. Every <laughs> I collect kids and I keep them. If, if there's a divorce, I keep the kids. 
They call me now their aunt mom. And Darby says, her brother Paul is now her new favorite cousin. Have <laughs> <laughs> you all heard that song, I'm My Own Grandpa? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a wedding at our wedding reception. Darby wrote a song for us, and it, is, it was so hilarious. But the chorus goes like this. <coughs> Thank you, Dick and Kathy for changing our family tree. Instead of branches and leaves, it's now a family wreath. And I don't know how you're related to me. <laughs> <laughs> we have 13, well, I'll get to that in a minute. 19 of our kids stood up with us at our wedding. <laughs> it was quite a celebration, and when we kissed, most of them grossed out. <laughs> Please hear me when I say I married my brother-in-law. I told this story at a group of ladies in Oregon one day, and there was this little old, 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 old lady right here could hardly catch half of what I was saying. And when it was all over, she just blurted out as loud as she could, she married her brother? <laughs> so I, I want you all to please understand, I did not marry my brother, okay? <laughs> We've been married now for 18 years. Oh my. And together we have 22 kids, counting the spouses, 33 grandchildren, counting the spouses, mm -hmm. and 17 great-grandchildren. Wow. You know what I'm going to say next, don't you? <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> what a story. What a life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, no mere man has ever seen, heard, or even imagined what wonderful things God has for those who love him. No one is here today by coincidence. God chose you to be here today. I believe that. I don't know where you are with God, but God does. And we don't know when we're going to take our last breath. We never know that. We need to be ready because where we go from here is our choice. And we either go with God or without Him. I don't want to be in eternity without God. God loves you as much as if you were the only one on this earth. And he's not willing for any of us to be lost. He gives us many chances to turn to him. But then one day it will be over. And we can't change our minds. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. If God is knocking on the door of your heart right now, invite him to come in and live his life through you. It will never be the same. Once he comes in, he will never leave you. You are his forever. Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins. That's why he chose to die on a gruesome cross. Just because of that. He has so much he wants to give us. Peace, joy, love, purpose, and eternal life. Talk to your pastor's wife. Talk to Kathy, talk to any of her family, or a friend here. Ask them to pray with you. And I'm willing to, if anyone wants to pray, I would love to pray with you. I have a lot to learn and a long way to go. But I know the Lord is working in my heart and in my life. And that's all I need him. He can take all the broken pieces make something very beautiful out of our lives. 
I've asked Angie to sing one of my very favorite songs. 